Welcome to the Too Busy to Eat Show. I am Greg Zaflato, the host of this show. Uh, today, we have Dr. Portia Jackson Preston on the show. She is amazing. First of all, you have to guess, um, she went to Stanford, Michigan, and UCLA. So the biggest issue we had is who does she root for when they play each other in basketball, football, mainly football, but who does she root for? So pick yours and see what she, she, she reveals it in, in the show. But um, Dr. Portia Jackson Preston, she has accomplished a huge amount in a short amount of time and has gone through some um, tough times of burnout and some health issues and how she came out on top of that and now helps others and is just and, and pouring now into the next generation. It's very impressive. Um, so I'm excited to share um, Portia with you. So let's listen to the episode and, and think about it. Remember, uh, Stanford, Michigan, UCLA, you got to make a pick. All right, enjoy the show. Well, welcome, Portia. I'm so excited to have you on the Too Busy to Eat show. Thanks for taking the time today to be with us. Thank you, Greg. I'm so happy to be here. You know, there's one question I didn't, you know, before we get into this, but I forgot to ask you before, um, you know, when, when Stanford, Michigan and UCLA all play each other, like who That's are right. you, who are you going to root for? <laughs> You've been at all okay, three so, schools. So. <laughs> right. So I will root for each one independently yeah. okay. as long That's as they're right. not playing each other. Yeah. Yeah. But if they're playing each other, which does typically happen yes. with Stanford and UCLA yeah. Every and year. Every occasionally year. with Stanford and Michigan, yeah. Yeah. I root for Stanford first. Okay. Okay. That's, that's where you, <laughs> that's where all started. So that's where you got to stay true to. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Those, those are not bad schools to root for. Those are some good. You, <laughs> no. <laughs> were you uh, were you a sports fan, you know, growing up and, and when you were at the schools or? I really wasn't. And yeah. then my first year, I actually ended up being on the rowing team. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So yeah. I learned a lot about, you know, dedication to the sport yeah. and what it takes. And yes. I yeah. became a big football fan. And, yeah. you know, the next thing I know, I've been to probably three or four Rose Bowls. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I really enjoy it now. Yes. yes. You're, you're definitely a fan. And, those, yeah, those, it would be hard to go to those three schools and not fall in love with, uh, especially football in those schools. Especially Michigan. They yes. take it as a religion. Football it, it Saturdays. Is, yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, as I was reading about you, I, I mean, I actually got exhausted just reading about all you've done and are doing. So <laughs> <laughs> why don't you Understood. give us a, a little background on, you know, kind of your journey to lead you to where you are today? Sure, I'd be happy to. So I grew up just being your standard overachiever, just really hardworking, uh, probably knew from the age of five, I, I knew I was going to be a doctor. So I was one of those <laughs> kind of kids. Yes. Uh, spent a lot of my high school years at different college programs, taking chemistry when yeah. most people are probably relaxing and enjoying their summers. Yep. So I probably had the recipe for imbalance <laughs> early on. I was well-rounded, but I, I worked pretty hard. And at that time, it was rewarding to do that. So I actually started college at 16. Oh my gosh. And so <laughs> when I finished college, I was 20. And when I first got to grad school, I mean, I couldn't even go to the bar for social, <laughs> you know, so it, it was different. But um, I had gone straight through after my master's and I just felt like, okay, I, I need to get my bearings and figure out what I really want to do next. So I worked for um, the Centers for Disease Control for two years. I right. uh, had a great experience, learned a lot about the field of public health and decided to pursue my doctorate. And so I started a program at USC and I ended up transferring over to UCLA. Okay. And that's where I got my doctorate of public health and health services. Wow. And that's kind of the end of when being an imbalanced, always working person stopped working for me. Right. Um, I would say maybe within a few weeks of finishing my doctorate, I had been diagnosed with a chronic illness. Oh, gosh. And I had heard for years about how stress could impact your health. And I dismissed it because I didn't see anything in the short term that would tell me that that was a problem. Right. And so I was, you know, finishing my doctorate. I'm starting a job in management consulting. And all I want to do is to be able to hit the ground running and prove how hardworking and dedicated and focused I am. So even though I had this diagnosis, I just went in 
you know, full, fully dedicated yeah. to the mission, right? Yeah. And I'd say about six weeks into it, I had a blood clot. Oh. And I was probably 30 at the time. Yeah. So I, I really had no outside comparison for how to navigate this. I had surrounded myself with other people who were very hardworking and it just it felt like a very lonely path to be navigating a chronic illness, recovering from a blood clot, and at a very demanding management consultant <laughs> position. So I kept working because what else would I do? <laughs> a couple of months later, I ended up on disability leave. Yeah, yeah. Because I really couldn't do anything. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm on steroids and, I mean, just every challenge you can think of just yeah. shaken up. So I was going between physical therapy, weekly doctor's appointments, trying to lose the weight, and trying to get back into my consulting position. Right. And so eventually I got better and I continued working in consulting for maybe another year or a year and a half. And around the two year mark, I said, this is really just it. I can't yeah. do this to myself anymore. Um, it, it was a great experience. It was a great time, but all of the travel and the hours, I knew it wasn't good for me in the long run. And I had started coaching people actually <laughs> um, during grad school. So I had this studying coaching practice and I thought, you know what, I'm going to do that full time. Yeah. So when I left consulting, that, that was my goal. And I would say three weeks later, I realized that I wanted to do something else, but I wasn't sure what it was. Right. So I, I kept building up my coaching practice and helping people decide their career decisions. And at the same time, I'm still navigating this illness. I'm still recovering from burnout. And I think it took going through that while coaching people to realize yeah. the elephant in the room. Yeah. I need to talk to people about burnout. Right, right, right. And I guess it, it just became a very meta experience at that point because I was no longer the coach speaking from this is my expertise, this is what I know, you know, before it was all about helping people find that position, right? Finding where they wanted to be, being happy. And now it was really about being reflective of my own experiences and relating to people who are overachievers who really didn't want to acknowledge the pressure they were putting on themselves right. and how it was affecting them. Yeah, yeah. So while I'm doing this, my own career is shifting. Yeah. So yes. I, I have a small coaching practice and I'm, um, teaching, adjunct lecturing right, at, right. at UCLA yeah. and just fell in love with the students. Yeah, right. Just said, oh my God, I, I, I really enjoy this. I've yeah. got to figure out, you know, how to keep doing this. And I thought that really just be it. I was just adjunct lecture. And about a year later, I'm, I'm teaching at UCLA and teaching at Cal State LA. I'm doing some nonprofit consulting. Still have my small coaching practice. I know that was a lot. Yeah, <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> I got an opportunity to apply for an assistant professor position. Oh, wow. And wow. this is something that I never imagined for myself. Right, right. And I said, well, let's just try it and see what happens. And long story short, about a year later, I started in a full time tenure track faculty position. Yeah. And it gave me the opportunity to revisit my coaching practice and what I really wanted to get out of it. And the first thing I realized was I really love to pour myself into working with my clients. Right, right. And so I made this difficult decision to shift away from individual coaching mm. because I now had all of these students who right. I wanted to be accountable to and yes. I wanted to be available for them. Right. So I shifted my practice into predominantly speaking, right, doing right. seminars, doing workshops, doing keynotes. Okay. And that's been immensely satisfying. And I think that that shift is the only way that I've been able to maintain my balance and my health because I am able to give my all in my career yeah. Yeah. while also giving something to myself. I learned how to hold back something for myself. Right, right. But now that's, that's fascinating because you're still, okay, so first of all, give me a comparison to you like, you accomplished so much at such a young age and, and really went all out and which led to burnout. I mean, led to where you, you know, right. to, a, to a chronic disease, but you're still pushing forward and doing all this. Now, what's the, you know, cause you're, you're doing, I mean, you're still you're <laughs> speaking, you're, you're a professor, you're doing, right. things, you're making an impact in the world and, and having tremendous success but you're more balanced now. What is the difference of the before you and, and the now? 
Right. And, you know, I can definitely hear from the way you say that. It makes you sound really busy, but it's really not that bad. <laughs> yeah. um, what I've really had to do is to be accountable for what I say yes to. Okay. So this being my second year on the tenure track, I'm still early into that career, but I'm starting to learn from my patterns. And so I right. realized that there's a certain point in my semester where I'm stressed out and the students are stressed out. <laughs> That's not the best way to learn. So maybe I could slow down this material and maybe I could d deliver it in a different way. Right. So I'm starting to pull back on the amount of time that I give okay. to preparing. I, I teach current health events in the healthcare system and health policy. So it's very easy to just sit and listen to the political stream all day. <laughs> but it's not probably healthy. Right, right. So <laughs> I've developed a system to kind of go in once a week and get the information that I need. Yep. And so I, I time box things. Um, time, same thing okay. with my so for academia, you know, we have to spend a certain amount of time in um, teaching, research, and service. But right. the funny thing is no one tells you how much time to spend. <laughs> so you could spend 80 or 90 hours a week doing that. Right. So what I have to do is for each one I have to set, and I hope this would be um, applicable for entrepreneurs, uh, for every area, what are the goals that I want to be measured by? Okay. How do I want someone else to tell my story? How do I want them to determine yeah. whether or not I'm successful? And once I know what those metrics are, I can kind of time box them around the current semester. Or if you're an entrepreneur, look at the quarter. Right. For this quarter, these are the things that I need to achieve in order to be successful. And then for each week, this is how many hours and the specific tasks that I need to complete yeah. in order to be successful in that area. Right. And so that outside metric really helps me stay on track. As far as the speaking goes, it's not as frequent as it sounds. Right. It's really yeah. just once in a while, and it's things that I really feel passionate about sure. or dedicated to. So yeah. an opportunity coming across that sounds great, but isn't, if it's something that someone else can do well, it's probably not the right thing for me. Right. And right. I right. know it's easy to think, what well, I the money, of course, <laughs> I would want to do this. And I've learned over time that it's, it's not enough. Right. Um, when I'm really passionate about an audience and the message that I have to convey and I believe that they're really going to be impacted by it, that's the type of opportunity that I'm going to make myself available for because I know the kind of quality I put into it. Right. I know that I do everything customized. I don't do canned talks. <laughs> so if I'm going to spend weeks or months preparing something, I want to make sure that it's the best fit for the organization and for me. Right. So right. like I said before, being very careful about what I say yeah. yes to. Yeah. Um, and I mean, just to finish that out, the other element that's really important to me, obviously, is my family, my relationship with my husband. Yes. So I've learned over time that if I don't spend time with him every day, and if I don't spend weekend time with my family and my friends, right. then everyone else gets diminished returns when it comes yeah. to me. Yeah, yeah. So right, right. I think that kind of gets put first, and then everything else is budgeted around that. Right. And just to close that out, there's just not time to do everything. Right. So you have to make sure that you're doing the most important things. That, so that leads me to a question that, and I think you covered it, but in different pieces, like, so what for you, what are the essential components to a balanced, healthy life? Um, sleep. Sleep, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with the basics. Yeah, oh <laughs> I man. I would say that if you're not sleeping, you don't have what it takes to be good to yourself, to yeah. be good to other people. Right. You don't have the resilience to deal with what comes. You don't have the stamina to endure. Right. So, right. and I know that, I mean, I'm, I'm not perfect. I don't get the ideal eight hours every night. Um, a lot of the times it's more like six or six and a half, but right. Right. under that, I know that I'm not going to be my best self. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. and I think going into that, having a routine, that positions you to be ready right. quickly. Right, you, right. You know, I'm not one of those people that just turns off and I'm out to the world. Um, the second thing I would say is honestly, uh, proper stress management and nutrition. Okay. So for me, my stress management means going to hot yoga three times a week. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's 90 minutes where I can turn yeah. off my phone and, yes. you know, just reconnect with yeah. and align my mind and body. Right, right. And I've realized the weeks in which I don't do that free time, yeah. I'm a lot more easily stressed right. by right, different right, things. Right. Yeah. And nutrition, um, once a week, doing the meal planning if you need to. We kind of have it down to a science now where we're yeah. just like, hey, 
protein, healthy carb, <laughs> vegetables, you yeah, know, right, dark right. chocolate. So right. it, it's not, you know, a, a major gourmet affair over here, but right. just once a week going to the store, making sure I have the items that I need so that I don't have to spend much time thinking about it. Right. And I would say if I have those three things figured out, the rest of the week is just going to flow a lot smoother. Another thing that I'll do is um, journaling to really okay. get my thoughts out on paper. Yep. It really helps to not have everything trapped up there. Therapy, I'm a huge fan yeah, yes. <laughs> of <laughs> mental health <Yeah. laughs> and having someone whose job it is to advocate for you. Yes. And yeah. the last thing I would say is um, planning your week. Okay. So sitting yeah. down with yourself yeah. and realizing what are all the things that I say I'm going to do this week? When would that actually yeah, happen? Yeah, yeah. Does any of this need to be cut out or postponed? Is there a way to delegate this? Right, you know, right. things like that. That's, those are fantastic. That's a, that's, that's just, uh, that's great information all in a big, uh, all, all succinct. I, I appreciate that. Cause I was, I mean, as you're going through, I'm like, yes, 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 yes. I mean, not that I follow and always do all these things, but there are in my, in my way, those all are, any of those that fall off, if I'm not planning, if I'm not taking care of my stress, I mean, productivity falls, uh, my relationships start right. to break down, everything. Right. It's like, right. I don't know how to explain that. Like, a, it's a, yeah, it's a component that they all need to be functioning for life to be moving forward right, right you know? Right. Yeah. That's great. That's really well, neat. Yeah. I would say that, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about willpower. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's really about systems. Yes. It, absolutely having systems in place believe, to support yeah, you yeah. if i come at myself from a harsh place and i say you have to do this you have to do that i'm kind of setting myself up for at first feeling really impressed with myself because <laughs> i'm doing all these amazing things yes, yeah. but then probably being very dissatisfied with myself because i can't sustain it right right right, right. and I, I think that you know in order to sustain a healthy practice we have to have certain systems in place yeah. that help to support that we yeah. can't put all of the pressure on ourselves yep. and we have to remember this idea of balance is not static there's no one out there that's practicing all of these things perfectly right and if they are right. they're yeah. probably unrelatable <laughs> and we don't do well comparing ourselves to them right. so you know yeah. we have to allow ourselves to be human yeah I just, yeah, I agree a hundred percent. I mean, I know no, nobody, first of all, nobody's doing all this perfectly all at once. I mean, you strive for that, but if you don't, you know, if you don't have everything, um, if you, the proper systems in place, um, will help you through your, for me, it helps you through your weakest moments. Like uh, if you think about meal planning, it's a great example meal planning. Well, if I don't know what I'm going to eat for the week, then all of a sudden, you know, you get to Wednesday and Thursday and you're stressed out. You're, you don't have the right foods and then you're going through a fast food restaurant or some, you know, something that. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And conversely, if, you know, we all get to the point where we just don't feel like cooking for that week. Yeah. And so really thinking about, is this a week where a meal delivery service yeah. would help me get through? Sure. Right. You know, yeah. um, or I know of a healthy restaurant where I can go pick up a salad and I know exactly what's in it. So if I don't get a chance to prepare, I know that's where I'm going to go to get my meal. Just even having that preparation. In right, right, right. Yeah, that, that is. Right, right. Now, we, you say systems, but I'm going to change the question. It's going to be the same, similar, but I can say what, what systems or what routines do you have in place to help you accomplish all sure. that you're set out to do? Because you are doing... You've done a lot in your life already. Um, <laughs> what, what, what systems or routines do you have in place to get that done? Okay, so I'm going to be a bit unconventional here. Um, <laughs> I, I would say probably go by my bedtime routine, but I don't know how popular my morning routine is going to be. Because <laughs> I have mornings where I get out of the house by 5.40 a.m. Right, okay. And That's early. When I am doing that, there's not really much room for a morning routine. Right. I'm getting up, I'm getting my food together, and I'm getting out of the door. Yeah. And a lot of that has to do with commute and traffic and sure. you know what time I teach my classes. Right. The days on which I'm not commuting, I actually like to have free time in the morning. Yeah. I like yeah. to be able to scroll my Instagram. And like I said, yeah. I know that's not popular. I'm telling you what works for me. Right. <laughs> so I, I like to be able to relax. And this morning is a good example. I, I had something that I used to do very early in the morning and I surprised myself because by 6 a.m. I was writing. Right. And right. I'm thinking, man, I usually spend 
wasting time just doing nothing. Right. But I need those recovery mornings because, sure. and maybe this is for some of your unconventional people out there. If you just had a 12 or 13 hour day that was grueling, yeah. that next morning, just being able, if you have that flexibility oh. to relax a little yeah. bit, I think we need to give ourselves permission to see what works best for us. Right. right. So my morning routine varies. Um, but in the evenings, I'm very good about this bedtime routine. And that is when I go to bed, I would say for about an hour before I actually go to sleep, I take time to do my devotional because that's when I can just shut out the world right, and right. refocus on my why and what's yeah. important to me. Yes. And it really just sets up the next day nicely. I take time to review my journal for that right. day. Yeah. And I look over what I'm planning to accomplish the next day. Oh, wow. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. so by the time I've done all of that, you know, the things that I would be up with anxiety about have all been dumped on the paper. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. And um, for me, melatonin works to help me yeah. okay. relax yeah. and go to sleep. So I would say I'm very good about that. And that all of that sets me up for the next morning right. because I'm never starting the next morning thinking, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I have my weekly routine that's already been established for the yep, week. Yep. I've journaled the night before. So that morning, I pretty much know, okay, get You're your right. breakfast. We're going to do 30 minutes of writing, you know, or we're going to yeah. teach. So right, right. You, that's, you, yeah. That is, that's your system. You're organized. You're ready to go because you're not, nothing's kind of, you know, flying by your seat of the pants. You always know what's next and that, that reduces stress. Right. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. I would say I was a big time procrastinator who just thought, you know, I can get things done the day before. Yeah. And I have this national talk I'm giving next Sunday. And this is the first time where I said six weeks before I'm going to start this and I'm going to talk with people early on and I'm going to get all this feedback. And I finished it this morning. Oh yeah. Yeah. A week and a half early. Yeah, and so awesome. now I have, right. Yeah, that's amazing. Yes. <laughs> so I, just as important it is, as it is for me to have some flexibility and some unstructured time to allow yeah. myself to recover from the long, hard days, it's more important to kind of figure out what your goals are and then backtrack and start them early and make small, consistent progress okay. so that you don't have to have huge binge cycles to get things done. Right, right, right. Yes, that's, that's fantastic. Now, so what, what's one piece? So for that person on a treadmill, like you were. Sure. Uh, <laughs> What's one piece of advice you can give to that really busy person that's trying to achieve and grow, grow, grow something or, or achieve something? What's one piece of advice you help them to help them achieve more of a, of a life balance or, or just more satisfaction in what they're doing because sure. avoid burnout? Sure. I, I could say so many things. I, yeah. I think the first thing I would say is to honestly just take a deep breath so that they can hear themselves and kind of tune out the world a little bit. Yeah. And if I can give them three words, it would be remember your why. Okay. Yeah. Remember, remember your why. why. Yeah. yeah. Why are you doing this? Why is this important to yeah. you? Yeah. Because you can start to evaluate everything that you're doing against that. And if you're doing too many things, yes. which of these is most central to yes. your why? Yeah. Yeah. What is the one thing I saw with my coaching clients? What is the one thing that if you did it, your life would be most different six right, months from now. Right, right. Well, it helps you filter those um, saying, you, like you said, one of the big things is your accountability to saying yes, what, what you're saying yes to, hold yourself accountable. So knowing, knowing your why allows you to say, this doesn't align with my, you know, my why. Exactly. I'm, I'm going to have to say no. Yeah, that's great. And you can come up with like, you know, I, I've read wonderful books to talk about how to say no in a way that people think you're saying yes. <laughs> because, you know, you're, you're kind of, you can think about it in a way of, well, you know, I think this is a really important goal. And I think that X, Y, Z would be a great way to approach this, you know, offer insights to them on how it gets yeah. done. But you don't have to put yourself at the center. A lot of us, myself included, take pride in being the solution to people's problems. Yeah. And so whether it's your kids or your boss or your colleagues, you're constantly inserting yourself into their solution. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes you have to step back and you have to empower people to make their own decision. Right. You can't continue to enable their mediocrity in order to reinforce your own superiority. <laughs> so <laughs> I like that line. That's a very good <laughs> <laughs> Being willing to step back and think about what's really central. Where can I be most impactful? And I know that we feel bad saying no sometimes, but the only way 
the reason I think it's important to say no is because it's the only way that you can actually say yes to yourself and the things that matter. Right, right, right. That, I, I really appreciate your insights. I mean, it's so helpful. Me personally, but the people that are listening, I mean, it's, it, what you've shared is, I mean, essential for anybody, but the people that are, are too busy to eat, I mean, this is a very, very powerful, um, uh, a lot of, a lot of power packed information in there for people. So in that, I know you don't do the one-on-one coaching anymore as much, but if somebody wants to kind of follow you, know what's, what you're doing, what you're, what's going on with you, um, maybe where you're speaking, where would they, where would they go to find you? So the best place to find me is my website. That's okay. www.portiajackson.com. And I'm also active on Instagram at okay. Dr. Portia JP. Okay. Dr. Portia JP. And we'll get both those in the show notes. Um, Portia, I was so, I'm so happy. I'm, I'm so glad you're on the show. This was great. Uh, you have sparked a lot of things in my head that uh, as um, I'm, you know, building a company, I'm, you know, that burnout thing is always in the back of my mind. So I appreciate your, your advice and your insight. And so thank you. And thank you. I appreciate you taking the time to be on the show. Thank you so much for your time, Greg. My pleasure.